Hello. This video is about musculoskeletal emergencies, and it is not intended to cover all details of this branch. It will cover the important points with some tips for the exam. According to the curriculum of the Royal College, musculoskeletal emergencies include the topics that you see now. Note that some topics are already covered with other branches, so we will not talk about them here. Let's start talking about the important details of these topics and let's start with upper limb pain and swelling. And one of the important conditions that cause pain in the upper limb is carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome is caused by compression of the median nerve in the carpal tunnel at the wrist. Compression of the median nerve leads to paresthesia, pain, and decreased function of the nerve. Nerve dysfunction may become irreversible if axonal injury secondary to prolonged ischemia occurs. Typical symptoms include intermittent tingling, numbness, and burning or pain in the distribution of the median nerve, which is the lateral three and a half fingers. Symptoms are often worse at night and can disrupt sleep. There are also some signs that can be used to confirm the diagnosis of compartment syndrome. These signs include Tinnell's sign. This means tapping lightly over the median nerve at the wrist causes pain or paresthesia in the median nerve distribution. Phelan's test. This test is positive when flexing the wrist for 60 seconds causes pain or paresthesia in the median nerve distribution. Carpal tunnel compression test. This test is positive when the pressure over the proximal edge of the carpal ligament with thumbs cause paresthesia to develop or increase in the median nerve distribution. Management of carpal tunnel syndrome may include avoidance of exacerbating activities, wrist splinting in a neutral position, local corticosteroid injection, and surgical decompression. These treatments should be tried in this order. Now, Let's move to pain around the elbow joint. And we will talk about two conditions that cause pain around the elbow joint, which are lateral epicondylitis and medial epicondylitis. And let's start with lateral epicondylitis. Lateral epicondylitis is commonly called tennis elbow. It follows repetitive or excessive stress to the origin of the forearm and hand extensor muscles at the lateral epicondyl. In lateral epicondylitis, inflammation, edema, and microtears occur within the extensor insertion. To confirm it, dorsiflexion of the pronated wrist against resistance will reproduce symptoms. Treatment is with analgesia, preferably non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and ice application. The arm should be supported in a broad arm sling and rest should be advised followed by progressive exercise and avoidance of aggravating movements. If symptoms are recurrent or prolonged, Steroid injection, forearm clasp, physiotherapy, and occasionally surgery may help. The other condition that causes pain around the elbow is medial epicondylitis. Medial epicondylitis is often called golfer's elbow. It is similar to lateral epicondylitis in pathophysiology, symptoms, and signs. It follows repetitive or excessive stress to the origin of the forearm and hand flexors muscles at the medial epicondyl. In medial epicondylitis, inflammation, edema, and microtears occur within the flexor insertion. To confirm it, flexion of the supinated wrist against resistance will reproduce symptoms. Treatment is as for lateral epicondylitis. Now, let's move to the hand. You should know pyogenic flexor tenosynovitis. Pyogenic flexor tenosynovitis is an infection of a finger flexor tendon sheath that may follow a penetrating injury. Classically, the evidence is in the form of Canaval's signs. And Canaval's signs include tenderness over the flexor tendon, symmetrical swelling of the finger, finger held in flexion at rest, extreme pain on passive extension. Note that redness and hotness are not included in these signs. Treatment of pyogenic flexor tenosynovitis consists of parenteral antibiotics and sheath irrigation. Another common localized infection in the hand is paronychia. Paronychia is an infection of the skin that surrounds a fingernail. In the early stages of paronychia, oral antibiotics, such as flucloxacillin or clarithromycin, may cure. Once pus has developed, 
It must be drained under local anesthesia. Once drained, do not give antibiotics. Unless there is cellulitis or spreading infection or the patient is immunocompromised and or has diabetes. Now, let's move to lower limb pain and swelling. And let's start with Morton's metatarsalgia. Morton's metatarsalgia is a burning discomfort radiating to the toes that may result from an interdigital nerve neuroma at the level of the metatarsal heads. The nerve between the second and third metatarsal heads is frequently affected. In Morton's metatarsalgia, there is localized tenderness, which is also reproduced on compression of the metatarsal heads together. For treatment, advise simple analgesia and GP follow-up to consider referral to a foot surgeon. Another condition that causes lower limb pain is plantar fasciitis. Plantar fasciitis is an inflammation that develops in the plantar fascia, typically at its calcaneal insertion. This results in gradually increasing burning pain in the sole of the foot and heel, which is worse on weight bearing. For treatment, advise non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, rest, and elevation for one to two days, with GP follow-up. A padded shoe insole or sorbothane heel pad may help. Severe, persistent cases are occasionally treated with local steroid injection or even surgical division of the plantar fascia. Another condition that causes lower limb pain is prepatellar and infrapatellar bursitis. This results from inflammation of the fluid-filled bursa in front of or just below the patella, respectively. For treatment, treat with rest, a short course of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and avoidance of the causative activity. Persistent symptoms may necessitate elective excision of the bursa. Now, let's move to neck pain. For neck pain, you should know the term, whiplash injury. Whiplash injury follows sudden or excessive hyperextension, hyperflexion, or rotation of the neck and causes neck pain and other symptoms. So, the most common symptom of whiplash is neck pain which may be referred to the shoulder or arm and headache. For treatment, encourage early return to usual activities and offer oral analgesics. Discourage rest, immobilization, and the use of soft collars. Also, for neck pain, you should know the term, acute torticollis. Acute torticollis is a painful condition that can include the following symptoms. Spasm of neck muscles, abnormal neck movements, and an awkward position of the head and neck. The cause of acute torticollis is not known. However, it may be due to issues with posture, as a result of poor positioning at a computer screen, inappropriate seating, sleeping without adequate neck support, or carrying heavy unbalanced loads. For treatment, offer people with acute torticollis oral analgesics and consider prescribing muscle relaxants. Also, for neck pain, you should know the term, cervical radiculopathy. Cervical radiculopathy is a pain in one or both of the upper extremities which corresponds to the dermatome of the involved cervical nerve root. Sensory and motor symptoms are present. The most common causes of cervical radiculopathy are degenerative changes, including cervical disc herniation, and spondylosis. The most common nerve root affected is C7 followed by C6. If cervical radiculopathy has been present for less than four to six weeks and there are no objective neurological signs, provide conservative management. If cervical radiculopathy has been present for four to six weeks or more, or there are objective neurological signs, refer to confirm the diagnosis with MRI and to consider invasive procedures. For cervical radiculopathy, you should know the dermatomes and myotomes of the upper limb to diagnose which nerve root is affected. Now, let's move to one of the important conditions in musculoskeletal emergencies, which is back pain. One of the common conditions is nonspecific low back pain. Nonspecific low back pain is diagnosed when the pain cannot be attributed to a specific cause, although in many cases, may be related to trauma, or muscular ligamentous strain. Non-specific low back pain is often a chronic problem in which periods of little pain are interrupted by acute episodes of severe pain. In back pain, 
it is important to look for the red flag symptom and signs of critical conditions. These red flag symptoms and signs should be excluded first before diagnosing non-specific low back pain. These red flag symptoms and signs are categorized according to the cause of the back pain as follows. The red flag symptoms and signs of Corda equina syndrome include severe or progressive bilateral neurological deficit of the legs, perianal or perineal sensory loss, which is called saddle anesthesia or paresthesia, recent onset bladder dysfunction in the form of urinary retention or overflow incontinence, recent onset fecal incontinence, laxity of the anal sphincter on digital rectal examination. The red flag symptoms and signs of spinal fracture include sudden onset severe central spinal pain which is relieved by lying down, history of major trauma, history of minor trauma, or even just strenuous lifting, in people with osteoporosis or those on corticosteroids, structural deformity of the spine, point tenderness over a vertebral body. The red flag symptoms and signs of malignancy include person 50 years or more of age, gradual onset of symptoms, severe unremitting or progressive lumbar pain that remains when the person is supine, aching night pain that prevents or disturbs sleep, pain aggravated by straining, pain in the thoracic or cervical spine, localized spinal tenderness, no symptomatic improvement after four to six weeks of conservative low back pain therapy, unexplained weight loss, past history of cancer. The red flag symptoms and signs of infection include fever, tuberculosis, or recent urinary tract infection, diabetes, history of intravenous drug use, HIV infection, use of immunosuppressants, or the person is otherwise immunocompromised. The red flag symptoms and signs of inflammatory disease include age less than 40 years old, Pain at night that is not relieved when the person is supine. Stiffness in the morning that is relieved with movement or exercise. Gradual onset of symptoms. Symptoms that have lasted for more than three months. Now, let's move to one of the causes of back pain, which is sciatica. Sciatica is caused by compression of one or more of the sciatic nerve roots in the lumbosacral spine. It occurs most commonly due to herniated disc at L4-5 and L5, S1 levels. Suspect sciatica if there is unilateral leg pain radiating below the knee to the foot or toes. Low back pain less severe than leg pain. Numbness, paresthesia, muscle weakness, or loss of tendon reflexes in the distribution of usually a single nerve root. Positive straight leg raising test which means that raising the leg whilst it is straight causes greater pain radiation below the knee and or more nerve compression symptoms. Positive sciatic stretch test, which means that dorsiflexion of the foot while the leg is raised will exacerbate pain. Now, let's move to another cause of back pain, which is ankylosing spondylitis. The features of ankylosing spondylitis include Chronic back pain and stiffness that improves with exercise, not rest. So the pain is worse in the morning and improves with activity. Sacroiliac joint and spinal fusion. Arthritis and enthesitis. Dactylitis, which means swelling of fingers or toes. Fatigue. Extra articular manifestations, such as anterior uveitis, psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease. For management refer to a rheumatologist for confirmation of the diagnosis, and consider prescribing a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug while waiting for referral. Now, let's move to another cause of back pain, which is spinal infections. The most common cause of spinal infections is Staphylococcus aureus, followed by Escherichia coli. Spinal infection can be in the form of vertebral osteomyelitis, discitis, or epidural abscess. The most important clinical features are severe back pain and fever with other clinical features. Vertebral osteomyelitis and ascitis are almost always present together, and they share much of the same pathophysiology, symptoms, and treatment. Contrast enhanced MRI is the gold standard for identifying spinal infection and assessing the neural elements. For management, 
Spinal infections often require long-term intravenous antibiotics. Immobilization may be recommended when there is significant pain or the potential for spine instability. Surgery may be indicated in some severe cases. Now, we have talked about some of the causes of back pain. In the exam, you may be asked about one of these causes. So, remember the main features of each cause to be able to diagnose the cause of back pain easily. Corda equina syndrome is characterized by the presence of bilateral neurological deficit of the legs, and remember that it is bilateral, is characterized also by the presence of saddle anesthesia or paresthesia and bladder and anal dysfunction. Sciatica is characterized mainly by unilateral leg pain, numbness, paresthesia, muscle weakness, or loss of tendon reflexes, and remember here that this is unilateral. Spinal fracture is characterized mainly by sudden onset severe central spinal pain which is relieved by lying down. Malignancy is characterized mainly by pain that is with gradual onset, progressive, aggravated by straining, with long duration and with weight loss. Infection is characterized mainly by the presence of fever with severe pain which may be localized and history of the source of the infection such as intravenous drug use. Inflammatory back pain is characterized mainly by stiffness in the morning that is relieved with movement or exercise. Now, let's move to gout. Gout is a disorder of purine metabolism characterized by hyperuricemia and the deposition of urate crystals in joints and other tissues, such as soft connective tissues or the urinary tract. The most commonly affected joint is the big toe. Gout tends to attack joints in the extremities because temperatures in the feet and hands can be low enough to precipitate urate from plasma. Thus, toe feet typically form in the helix of the ear, fingertips, olcranon bursi, and other cool anatomical sites. The clinical features include mainly arthritis and toe feet. Arthritis is in the form of swelling, redness, warmth, and pain on passive movement typically of the first metatarsophalangeal joint, although any joint can be affected. Tophi are firm, white nodules under translucent skin, usually occurring over extensor joint aspects such as the elbow or knee, or Achilles tendon. They can occur in other areas such as the helix of the ears or dorsum of hands or feet. It usually takes at least 10 years after the first attack of acute gout for Tophi to develop. They are usually pain-free but can become inflamed, infected or ulcerated, or discharge white material. Treatment of acute attacks of gout is by non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or colchicine. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are prescribed at a maximum dose as early as possible, and continue the treatment until one to two days after the attack has resolved. Co-prescribe a PPI for gastric protection. Joint aspiration and intra-articular corticosteroids are an option in people with acute monoarticular gout. A short course of oral corticosteroids or a single intramuscular corticosteroid injection can be considered in people who cannot tolerate non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or colchicine. Start your rate lowering therapy after the acute attack has resolved, not during the attack but do not stop allopurinol or febuxostat during an acute attack of gout if the person is already established on these drugs. Now, let's move to osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is a disorder of synovial joints which occurs when damage triggers repair processes leading to structural changes within a joint. The diagnosis of osteoarthritis is mainly clinical, and the clinical features include activity related joint pain and this is different than rheumatoid arthritis pain which is rest related pain that improves with activity so there is no morning joint related stiffness or morning stiffness lasting no longer than 30 minutes the other clinical features include bouchard's nodes which are bony nodules on proximal interphalangeal joints heberden's nodes which bony nodules on distal interphalangeal joints joint effusions, joint warmth and or tenderness, muscle wasting and weakness, restricted and painful range of joint movement, joint crepitus, joint instability, 
Antalgic gait. Routine X-ray of the affected joints is not usually needed to confirm the diagnosis. But if the X-ray is done, the typical radiological features of osteoarthritis include subchondral bone thickening and or cysts, osteophyte formation, which is new bone formation at joint margins, loss or narrowing of the joint space. For management, prescribe analgesia, recommend physical treatments, such as strengthening exercises, physiotherapy, local heat, cold packs, etc. Surgery is used if the person has joint symptoms that have a substantial impact on their quality of life and are refractory to non-surgical treatment. Now, let's move to rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic systemic inflammatory disease, typically presenting as inflammatory arthritis typically affecting the small joints of the hand and feet, and usually symmetrically. Although, any synovial joint may be involved. It is more common in women than in men. There is no specific diagnostic test for rheumatoid arthritis. The diagnosis is clinical, and the clinical features of rheumatoid arthritis include pain, which is usually worse at rest, swelling around the joint, but not bone swelling. Early morning stiffness usually lasts over one hour. Rheumatoid nodules, which are hard firm swellings over extensor surfaces. Systemic features such as malaise, fever, sweats, weight loss, lymphadenopathy, and other extra articular features. Also, there are characteristic hand signs on examination which include subluxation and ulnar deviation at metacarpophalangeal joints, Botonier's deformity, which means hyperflexion of proximal interphalangeal joint and hyperextension of distal interphalangeal joint. Swan neck deformity, which means hyperextension of proximal interphalangeal joint and hyperflexion of distal interphalangeal joint. Z deformity of the thumb. Bowstring sign, which means that tendons appear prominent and stretched across a shrunken carpus. For management, Give the patient analgesics and refer to a specialist to offer a conventional disease modifying anti rheumatic drug. Now, let's move to septic arthritis. Septic arthritis is the infection of one or more joints caused by pathogenic inoculation of microbes. Hematogenous spread from bacteremia is the most common cause. It can also be caused by contiguous spread from infected periarticular tissue and direct inoculation from external skin puncture wound. The predominant causative organisms of septic arthritis are Staphylococcus or Streptococcus bacteria. For diagnosis, regard a hot, swollen, acutely painful joint with restriction of movement as septic arthritis until proven otherwise. The definitive diagnosis is done by joint aspiration and synovial fluid evaluation. For management, admit the patient for intravenous antibiotic treatment and joint drainage. For antibiotic treatment, start empiric IV antibiotics then switch to pathogen-targeted antibiotics when microbiology culture and sensitivity results become available and continue intravenous treatment for up to a total of two weeks or until signs improve. After two weeks of successful intravenous treatment start an oral antibiotic with the same spectrum of activity. Repeat joint aspiration to dryness is often as necessary. This helps remove infection and manage pain by relieving pressure within the joint. Prescribe simple analgesics if the patient reports ongoing pain. Now, let's move to one of the most important topics in pediatric emergencies which is acute childhood limp. There are several causes of acute childhood limp, and we will talk about the most important causes in brief. Fractures are one of the most common causes of acute childhood limp. Fractures are covered under the branch of trauma, but here we will mention only that there is a type of fracture called toddler's fracture, which is a subtle undisplaced spiral fracture of the tibia typically seen in preschool children. It is usually caused by a sudden twist, often after an unwitnessed fall. This commonly affects new walkers. Affected toddlers present with difficulty or refusal to bear weight. Another cause of acute childhood limp is developmental dysplasia of the hip. 
It is a congenital condition where the ball and socket hip joint fails to develop normally. A physical exam may reveal asymmetric skin folds, extremity shortening, and limited hip abduction. Untreated developmental dysplasia of the hip may lead to hip pain and or osteoarthritis in older children. Another cause of acute childhood limp is transient synovitis, a self-limiting inflammatory disorder of the hip. It is more common in boys than in girls and is rare in children aged younger than three years. It presents acutely with mild to moderate hip pain and limp, and there is no or only mild restriction of hip movements, especially abduction and internal rotation. Children are otherwise well and are febrile. The diagnosis of transient synovitis is one of exclusion. The Cocker criteria is a useful tool in the differentiation of septic arthritis from transient synovitis. Cocker criteria include the following. History or presence of fever greater than 38.5. Child not weight bearing on the affected side. ESR greater than 40 mm per hour. White cell count greater than 12. The absence of these criteria means that the diagnosis is mostly transient synovitis. Another cause of acute childhood limp is Perthes disease. Perthes disease is an idiopathic avascular necrosis of the developing femoral head. The child will typically present with limitation of hip rotation and a subacute limp. The child is systemically well with no other joint involvement. Most children with Perthes disease have good outcomes, but long-term complications may include chronic pain and osteoarthritis. Another cause of acute childhood limp is slipped upper femoral epiphysis. Slipped upper femoral epiphysis is the most common hip pathology in pre-adolescent and adolescents. In slipped upper femoral epiphysis, for reasons that are not well understood, the ball at the head of the femur slips off the neck of the bone in a backward direction. This causes pain, stiffness, and instability in the affected hip. When there is a sudden displacement of the epiphysis, the child presents with sudden onset of severe hip pain with the leg held in external rotation. Gradual displacement of the epiphysis may cause only mild discomfort of the hip or only referred knee pain. Anteroposterior and frog leg lateral x-rays show widening of epiphyseal line or displacement of the femoral head. The lateral x-ray is the best way to identify a subtle slip. Trithouen's sign is seen on the anteroposterior view, in which a line drawn along the superior border of the femoral neck, called Klein's line, passes above the femoral head, instead of intersecting the femoral epiphysis. It is important to remember the views of X-ray that are used in the diagnosis of slipped upper femoral epiphysis, which are anteroposterior and frog leg lateral views. And also, it is important to remember the Trithouen's sign. Prompt diagnosis and management are crucial to avoiding further displacement and the development of avascular necrosis. Another cause of acute childhood limp is Osgood-Schlatter disease. Osgood-Schlatter disease means multiple small avulsion fractures within the ossification center of the tibial tuberosity at the inferior attachment of the patella ligament caused by forceful contractions of the quadriceps muscles. It is a usually self-limiting disorder causing anterior knee pain during adolescence, particularly in children active in sport. On examination, there may be tenderness over the tibial tuberosity and firm or bony enlargement of the tibial tuberosity. X-ray is not required routinely but if undertaken, knee X-ray may be normal or may demonstrate anterior soft tissue swelling and fragmentation of the tibial tubercle. Another cause of acute childhood limp is Sever's disease. Sever's disease is caused by repetitive microtrauma from the pull of the Achilles tendon on the unossified apophysis. It is most common in boys aged 10 to 12 years who are active in sports. It often resolves within two weeks to two months, but a child may have recurrent symptoms until skeletal maturity. Another cause of acute childhood limp is osteochondritis dissecans. Osteochondritis dissecans occurs when a small piece of subchondral bone begins to separate from its surrounding area due to a disturbance of the local blood supply. Clinical findings are subtle and a small effusion or limited range of joint movement may be the only sign. Locking or instability suggests a loose body in the joint. 
Another cause of acute childhood limp is chondromalacia patelli. Chondromalacia patelli describes anterior knee pain typically felt when walking up or downstairs. Affects children between the ages of 10 to 19 years. Another cause of acute childhood limp is septic arthritis. We have already talked about septic arthritis. It is an infection of the synovium and joint space. It can present in any joint but most commonly affects the lower limbs. Clinical features include refusal to bear weight and fever. Another cause of acute childhood limp is osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis is an infection of the bone. It usually involves a single bone but may rarely affect multiple sites. The most common presenting signs are pain with palpation and decreased limb use.